we're starting our second lecture on World War One, and as a reminder, we left off the last lecture with Serbia standing up to Austria-Hungary. Austria-Hungary feeling angry and frustrated. They can't really do anything to this defiant Serbia because Serbia is allied with the big giant Russian bear Colossus staring off in the distance here. So that's where we left off. Troubles begun to accelerate as we move towards the start of the war. And the first major event that does this occurs on June 28, 1914. That's when the Austrian Archduke Franz Ferdinand and his pregnant wife, Sophie, are shot and killed. What's the events leading towards this? Franz Ferdinand and his wife, Sophie, are in Sarajevo in Bosnia in order to be able to attend the Austrian military summer maneuvers. Remember, Austria really can't do anything militarily to do anything to Serbia. So what it's going to do here is bring down its army to the Bosnian town of Sarajevo, which the Serbs believe belongs to Serbia. And it's going to have its army run through drills, practice showing off all their marching and maneuvering and shooting their rifles and their artillery pieces to kind of puff up their chest and kind of show everything that they all got that there. So Franz Ferdinand, the heir to the throne of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, is in there. Now, they don't pick a very good date in order to do this. June 28th is the anniversary of the Serbian defeat of Kosovo in 1389. This, as you know, is the holiest day of the Serbian national calendar, St. Vitus's Day. So the Austrian Archduke has decided to do his summer manu military maneuvers on kind of like the... Uh, it, it's it's the 4th of July for kind of the Serbians, if you want to think of it that way. Uh, I mean, the same thing as if Great Britain showed off, showed up in the Bahamas, right, and the 4th of July and started shooting off its rifles and guns and showing all its cool stuff that it has. So kind of the same feeling from there. They are assassinated by a group of Serbian nationals. And this is where the, it kind of gets a little bit murky, but it's, a, it's by a group of Serbian nationals called the Black Hand, which is this kind of terrorist group that goes by the name Cerna Ruka. Now, this is important because this is not just a bunch of goofballs yet. This is led by higher-ups in the Serbian army who know exactly what they're doing and setting up. The leader of the Black Hand is Colonel Dragutin Dimitrovic. And he is just one of the seven officers of the Serbian army who founded this organization to commit terror attacks like this assassination here. Well, that's what it's going to do. They found three young goofballs right, in Serbia who were willing to sign up to go on a suicide mission into Austria-Hungary held territory in order to be able to commit this act from there. The idea being that they're going to kill themselves. Uh, once they do that, so it'll just become a mystery and the Serbians will be able to take advantage of the chaos. They are armed with four revolvers, six bombs, and cyanide tablets, and then smuggle and then are told to smuggle themselves and await further instructions and carry out their plan once they do that. Again, the cyanide tablets are not for anybody else, they are for the three young assassins to be able to go and commit suicide once they uh, complete their mission. The trigger man in all this is Gavrilo Princep. He is the one that pulls the trigger that murders Franz Ferdinand and his pregnant wife, and he's the one that's going to set off the chain reaction that's going to lead right into the outbreak of hostilities. That's Franz Ferdinand. Um, he's the colorized picture of him. It's the same picture as colorized there on the right there. Uh, he has the distinction of one of being the great hunters of animals in all of, uh, world history. Um, he had his own special railroad car that would travel uh, kind of through the Austrian Alps and through the, the kingdom that had an open kind of platform at the end with all sorts of guns. And he'd go and shoot any animal or bird that would kind of fly by. And there would be another train or a group of people in the woods that would go and collect all this stuff to kind of bring it back from. So it's a little trivia fact about him. He is with his wife, Sophie, and this is one of the great love stories of like kind of the European monarchy. Um, again, most of the monarchs are forced to marry into the other great families of Europe to kind of, again, get the idea of pure noble uh, blood. Uh, but Sophie was not. She was kind of uh, somebody that the Archduke met on the street, fell in love with her, and they were, well, I'll say happily married. 
the issue that they run into is that he has the Habsburg right, uh, blood coursing through his vein, veins, and she's got poor dirtball gutter trash blood right, as a peasant. And so they really – that she can't eat with the royal family at kind of official – Distinctions. And so from there, she's got to eat with the servants, and it's kind of there. So it, there's kind of that animosity amongst the royal family there. And so the Archduke, acting not as a member of the royal family, but as a member of the leader of the Austrian military, can have his wife accompany him as they go into Sarajevo uh, that day. So they're kind of looking for a weekend away from the kids. It's going to be a, a fun time. And again, they can actually sit down and interact with each other as they go in there. So they are arriving all right, in there, and they know what's going on. Now, the Archduke and the Austrian Empire, knowing that this is a big deal, had published months prior to this the parade route and all the other stuff that they had gotten set up. So the assassins had um, figured out their way to be able to go and figure out exactly how they were going to plan everything out. The three assassins from the Black Hand were then uh, able to recruit a couple other people and so on the morning of june 28th they all were supposed to be in their different positions along the way with that if the first person couldn't get a clear shot or a clear assassination attempt they wouldn't have to stress it they'd be able to find from there i'm going to bring your attention here to the river that's right there so the first person who is kind of uh, was supposed to be in, in charge there. He overslept in there and ran from there. The second person, all right, is there, is in position. He's waiting, he's waiting, he's waiting, and he gets his chance, and he's the one that's going to throw a bomb. That bomb, all right, is going to, as the, this is not what's happening, but the bomb is going to go, and it's going to hit the front of the open car, which the Archduke and his wife are traveling, bounce over the top, hit the ground, and then roll along the ground, all right, detonating. In, in underneath the second car and carving a pretty good sized crater in the street, injuring pretty severely a group of army officers in the second car. As you probably can imagine, this is going to cause all sorts of chaos and people are going to be scattering to the winds all over the place. Right? Uh, before we get to that, so, so we circle back here to our map. That's going to cause this guy to then realize, oh boy, I'm in trouble. But luckily, he's right next to the river running right down through Sarajevo. So he takes the cyanide caplet, pops it in his mouth, and he jumps into the river, knowing that the river will safely carry his body away down, uh, and it'll no one be the riser. Problem is, again, you're not dealing with the 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 best organized, the brightest, the bunch here. The the best stuff here is their cyanide tablets are um, expired. So instead of biting into it and then dying within several seconds, right? It bites into them and turns into an acid and begins to kind of slowly erode like the insides of them. If you've seen uh, Javier uh, Bardem in Skyfall, when he like pops his jaw out of his mouth, that's kind of, again, the same type of idea. But he's, again, you're going to fall in the river and then go and be carried away. Right? And from there, he'll just drown. It'll be then that. The problem is, is that the month of June had seen incredibly dry conditions throughout Sarajevo. So instead of being a giant rushing river, it's a trickling stream in a rocky riverbed. So he falls, smack, lands on the riverbed. They pull him out there. He doesn't have a real great time. The Archduke now has to make a decision, and he's upset that he um, was nearly blown up. So he goes and makes a speech at the town hall like he was supposed to and says, hey, stop trying to blow me up. This is wrong, and is pretty angry about it from there. As he's leaving, he has to then make a decision. And what he decides to do is say, hey, I don't want to go to my next spot. I want to go visit the army officers to make sure they're okay. And then um, he comes out, and that's what, what's going on from there. So they then drive away from the town hall when the... Archduke realizes, hey, driver, I asked you to, you don't have to carry me away. I want to go see my officers. And he says, apologize. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. And then he turns down a narrow alleyway in order to be able to go and make a U-turn and pull out. It's down that narrow alleyway that Gavrilo Princep had when the first bomb had gone off, scattered to the winds, and was kind of figuring out, plotting, ah, oh, crap, I missed my chance, and how am I going to be able to do that? When, in all of the circumstances, right in front of him turns the Archduke. 
He then fires uh, three shots, uh, one that hits the uh, Archduke in the abdomen, one that hits him in the throat. He's going to die uh, in, in a couple of minutes. And then the third shot is going to hit Sophie in her abdomen, and she's going to die several hours later. And uh, this picture, this is the little alleyway with a couple of streets where, where again, this picture, X literally marks the spot. That's where the Archduke and his car were turning around when Prince of Cain and, and shot him. As you probably can imagine, there is a whole heck of a lot of blood. If you go to uh, this museum in Austria today, you can see the actual uh, uniform that the Archduke was wearing. You can see just how much blood was, was all over because that, that's the uniform that he was wearing. There's the car that they were traveling in um, that day. This causes all sorts of problems. Uh, the uh, police of Sarajevo begin to round up all the usual suspects. This could be Princep, but it's more likely uh, an, another person that they just went and, and kind of grabbed uh, to um, kind of just show that they're trying to do something or whatever from there. And then again, uh, they begin to arrest a whole lot of other people to be able to decide what they're going to do because you have the heir, the person who's going to take over the Austrian Hungarian Empire when the elderly Franz Josef dies. His wife, they leave behind several children. This is a national tragedy for the, excuse me, for the Austrians. So this is Princep. Uh, he's going to, uh, he's the trigger man. He is, again, with all the other people that they have uh, along the way there from this. Princep's quote is, he says, I'm not a criminal because I destroyed that which was evil. I think that I am good. And that's, again, this idea of nationalism. This is the motivation that he's acting upon. He's going to be uh, given, um, uh, prison sentence, uh, but he's going to die from tuberculosis uh, before the war is over uh, while he's in the prison. So this is going to be the event that touches a stuff all stuff in there. So again, on the previous slide, June 28, 1914, Archduke and wife killed. They're not there anymore. Takes about a month, and obviously there's a lot of stuff that's going on for here for Serbia to figure out how it's going to react or how it's going to get a reaction from Austria. So on July 23rd of 1914, Austria sends Serbia an ultimatum. If you do not do this, then we are going to go to war. Basically, it's a list of 15 demands, 15 demands, as I said that word, um, kind of the, the bigger ones, no pro-Serbian press. The Serbs can't say this is a great thing. You can't do all this other stuff. So there's nothing in the newspapers that can promote this or any other kind of pro-Serbian kind of nationalist ideas. And Austria is demanding that Austrian kind of quote-unquote detectives are going to be sent into Serbia to help figure out and round up what's going on from this. It's important to understand that Austria knows exactly what it's doing and what it's saying when it's making these 15 demands. These 15 demands are made to be deliberately unacceptable. In these 48 hours, Austria knows that Serbia cannot agree to any of these conditions and be able to still be able to hang their heads up as a sovereign nation amongst the countries of the world. And so the 48-hour deadline comes and goes without a response from Serbia. And so because of this, on July 28th, Austria goes and declares war on Serbia. Now. In the background this entire time, Germany has been talking with Austria-Hungary. The Kaiser is all upset about this, and he's been urging them on. He's been saying, you have to respond. You can't just do anything. You can't just let this go by. This must be met with aggression. And on July 5th, he famously gives Austria a blank check of support. Now, again, you write a check with a dollar amount. That goes to somebody. They cash the check. It draws out of your checking account. And that's how a check works. So you have to put a dollar amount on it. What we want you to understand here is that Germany is saying, this is a blank check. You fill in the dollar amount, whether it's $5, $10, $5 billion, whatever you want, whatever Austria has, wants to do, Germany is going to be right there beside them, leading the way. You have all of our blanket support from there. So, so Germany is backing up, is really pushing Austria to go and do this. This is where the alliance system begins to kick in. On July 29th, Russia begins to mobilize its army in support of Serbia. Russia is allied with Serbia. Austria-Hungary has decided to attack Serbia. And so now Russia is getting involved in the war planning and the moving its stuff here. Yeah. 
On July 31st, Germany now begins to pop back in the story and tells Russia, stop mobilizing your army or you're going to face war in 12 hours. Now, here's the, here's the thing here. It, it makes sense that Russia is mobilizing to protect their ally, Serbia. It makes sense that Austria has declared war on Serbia because Serbia has assassinated its leader. But really, Germany is kind of just inserting itself into this. It's kind of been a background player with the Blake check. And now it's saying, telling Russia, hey, stop it. Or now Germany is going to go to war against Russia. It's on July 31st that the Schlieffen plan for Germany kicks in. The Schlieffen plan for Germany is in place because Germany is facing the problem of having enemies on both sides of it. To the east, it has Russia. To the west, it has France. And so Germany, like we said prior to this, has the best army in the world, including a general staff whose idea is and, and job is just to create plans for different scenarios. So now this is the plan that's going and kicking in from this. What the Schlieffen plan says is that Knowing how inadequate the Russian logistical system is, the Germans know it'll take Russia six weeks from once it, said, once it says it's starting the war. So Russia's mobilized in late July here, but it's going to take six weeks for that army to go from their farms to the barracks, get their uniforms, get their guns, and then move ever so slowly through the giant Russian countryside to be able to get to the German borders. Germany says, that it can quickly attack to the west, overwhelm France in 39 days by conducting a surprise attack through a neutral Belgium, and then be able to defeat France's army, swallow up the leadership, turn all the way back around the country, and then meet Russia just as it's beginning to show up at the border of Germany. So that's what's going to do here. Now, again, we're trying to understand here of who's to blame with the start of the war. Germany now is bringing in Belgium, which is neutral, is backed up by all these other places and saying no from there. And France, who has, by this point, uh, and this story has not gotten into a wall here. And now Germany is involving them just so that it can go and defeat the Russians right in that time. The dilemma the Germans are facing, though, is that the Schlieffen plan is all about timing. And we're talking the most precise of precise troop movements all right, from there. The problem they're facing is that once you start the Schlieffen plan, you cannot stop it. Because once it goes, like a domino, you need the 13th domino to fall at exactly the right time so that the 20th domino can fall. And so you get that idea. You can't stop it once it's started. And then the other dilemma Germany faces is that every second you wait to start the plan, it allows the Russians to get closer and closer and closer. And so the Germans have to, or, or the German army command is saying, we need 6,010 railroad cars on 140 trains just for our men to be able to get this plan in place. We need another 6,010 railroad cars on another 140 trains just for their supplies. 40 army corps of men, machines, horses, and supplies in total. And they need to get it started as soon as they can. And every second the Kaiser waits, the Russians are coming. Russians are coming. So while Austria is trying to figure out what it's going to do, once the Russians decide they're going to mobilize the German high command, the army gets all concerned and it's going to Kaiser. You've got to start the plan. You've got to start the plan. You've got to get this going. And so again, this becomes kind of the old proverbial boulder at the top of the mountain where it looks pretty solid, but you give it a little push. There's no way to pull that boulder back. It's going whether you like it to or not. And it's going to have all those unintended consequences once it's going from there. And so that's what Germany is doing. And so this is where the kind of militarism Germany gets it into problems. Because Germany is facing the problem of having Russia to the west, right? it's going to decide to let the French attack into Germany because it's going to swing its main force of its army through Belgium. They're not going to expect that. Schlieffen, right, the German general in the early 1900s, says he's going to brush the channel with his right sleeve, right? Circle around, capture, capture Paris, capture from behind all the French army, and then sweep across Germany to attack the approaching Russian army from the east. Well, that's what Germany's doing. So, in the natural state of affairs, August 1st, Germany goes and declares war on Russia. 
August 2nd. Germany then turns to Belgium and says, will you politely and secretly allow our army to pass through your country and let us go through so we can attack France? We don't want anything to do with you. Please let us do so. The Belgians say, no, you can't do that. There's no reason for you to be in our country. Stay out of our country. Stay on your side of the line. This is when Great Britain gets involved. Britain also warns Germany, do not invade Belgium. The British, since the early 1800s, have declared Belgium a neutral territory because of, again, Belgium being a quick uh, dot across the English Channel towards Britain. Britain feels that it's in Britain's national interest to keep that area neutral or at least a friendly force. On August 3rd, Germany declares war on France. And on August 4th, Germany then invades through Belgium, going and starting the plan from there. It's then here when Britain enters the war. Britain enters the war on August 4th, 1914, by stating that they're going to protect Belgian neutrality that they signed, but was well, an agreement signed by most European nations in 1839. And that slip of paper is why Great Britain is now going into the war. And so by August 4th here, you now have most of the major combatants. We'll see a couple more kind of add their names to the list here. But your big powers in Europe, Germany, Austria-Hungary, have now attacked Serbia, Russia, France. Great Britain is now come on the side of the Allies in order to be able to protect Belgium. If we take a back seat from all this and we look at this from our 2020 uh, historical position, this makes no sense for Germany to do this. There's no logic in this decision for Germany to invade France, so can defeat Russia in a conflict between Austria and Serbia, but go through a neutral Belgium, who are all supported by Great Britain. If you want to get into this idea of how does this turn from a localized conflict into a world war, here's your issue here. Because once all these guys kind of be thrown into the meat grinder that is the Western and Eastern fronts, then they're going to have to call on their colonial troops, and this becomes a major problem that exists uh, from this decision. So at the outset of the war, this is what Britain says it's going to do. Remember, Belgium enlists today. This scrap of paper right, is what Britain wants to do, help to do that, right, be able to protect the Belgians. And that's what Great Britain says it's going to warn. What we see across Europe once the wars occurred here is major pro-war demonstrations occur in some capital cities with people celebrating that they're going to war. And this is referred to by a lot of people as the August Madness, because you have all these people whooping and hollering and saying, we're going to war, this is going to be great, it's going to be fun. But what we want to understand is that these demonstrations are not resent representative of the entire country. Right? You get a couple 10,000 people in a Berlin or a Paris or a, a Moscow, but the millions in all the rest of the countries aren't really ha happy about this. Most are hesitant. Most see this as, as not a real great thing happening, except in Germany. Germany, as we said, is really pro-military. Germany publishes one million war poems in newspapers in August of 1914 alone. When was the last time you were so happy about something, you wrote a poem and then mailed it into a newspaper to be published? And here we have a million of these, and some of these are some of the worst examples of poetry you can imagine. Okay. But this goes to show that Germany is a little bit of the odd duck here in the situation. However, in August of 1914, most people all out here see this as their patriotic duty to support the war by either enlisting or by allowing their sons to go off to war and from there. So these are just some examples of the August Madness. Again, not only of demonstrations of people in the crowds, but also uh, the armies are marching off to go fight in war from there. Uh, particularly in uh, Germany, in Munich, they go from there. And one person who's, who's circled, who's extraordinarily excited about this, is our buddy Adolf Hitler. And Hitler, in the 1930s, when he was rising to power, said that he was at this uh, plaza at, at this time. Uh, when he first heard about it, the photographer went back, and lo and behold, he was able to pick him out of the crowd uh, right there. So the war begins on the Western Front, right, between the Germans and the British and the Belgians, with the Germans invading into uh, Belgium. They are slowed down from the first go. They are not expecting the 
Belgians to put up much of a fight, and when they do, it causes all sorts of different problems uh, from there. Um, the Schlieffen plan had been weakened, right, through different iterations of it from its uh, original to its there, so it doesn't have the overwhelming force on its far right side that's supposed to be sweeping against the English Channel, the other ones, um, and so from there. It does catch the French off guard, and the British army that lands, that's kind of the old British Imperial Army that's fought in all these Imperial conflicts, is pretty much gone by the end of 1914 because it's fighting this delayed retreating action, allowing for the Belgians to kind of retreat through their country and the French to get their act together to stop attacking into Germany, swing back and help them out. We have what's called the miracle at the Marne. When the French finally realize what's going on, they hire thousands of Paris taxi cabs to drive to the French soldiers, pick them up, and then drive them apart, put them into the front of the Germans. That makes the Schlieffen plan obsolete, and that's when, in front of the artillery and the machine guns, they begin to dig into the trenches from there. In 1914, on the Eastern Front, the Germans begin to get panicked when the Russians get closer and closer and begin to start invade into Eastern Prussia. The German high command is made up of all these old Prussian leaders, so they get spooked that the, the Russians are now going through their part of where their homelands are, where their daughters, where their wives, where their dogs, where their farms are. So they send troops from the Western Front to the Eastern Front, and they begin to fight. And uh, it's called the Battle of the Mausian Lakes or the Battle of Tannenberg. And basically, the sleeping giant of Russia awakens, but it's nowhere near prepared for reality. The Russians marched pretty much a straightforward slaughter uh, into the Germans. And basically, for all intents and purposes, this really blunts any sort of Russian offensive into Germany. It really starts that, and this is going to kind of be the end of anything Russia can do. As we move into 1915, the Germans unleash the submarine, right? the menace of the North Sea, the hidden killer, to try to be able to starve the British out of the war as the British and the French begin throwing themselves into the German trenches and the Germans vice versa. On the Eastern Front, the British try to get around the trenches that are developing in 1915 by having the Vice Lord of the Almerty, a guy named Winston Churchill, come up with a plan to talk, attack what he calls the soft underbelly of Europe, to go around the trenches on the Western Front, attack what he feels the, is the weakest of the Central Powers, the Ottoman Empire, you go from there. Uh, the British then send troops, a lot of New Zealand and Australian troops end up in Gallipoli. Uh, and basically this doesn't work out and you end up with trenches, which we'll talk about in our uh, next lecture, right? just in Turkey as well. It's a big giant mess. But what we have here, again, remember the Germans talk all about their railroad superiority and all that stuff, but a lot of their major offensive begins on foot right, and on horseback and with a, just a few people in cars. This is not the mechanized warfare that you're familiar with of any like um, modern armies here. This is still very much just how armies have fought since the ancient Egyptians on foot or with horseback. And again, it's a lot of uh, going through open farmland and attacking uh, from there. As we zip ahead to the um, 1915s with Gallipoli, the Winston Churchill wants the British to take the Dardanelles be able to choke off Constantinople and Istanbul from the Ottoman Empire. And so he's going to land troops, British, Australian, New Zealand troops, at the Gallipoli Peninsula, try to use the British warships to try to blow stuff up. And they are met by much stiffer resistance than they're expecting. Uh, they're able to land the troops, but they're not able to get very far in. And so basically they're stuck in the trenches trying to play games with their capturing uh, Ottoman troops uh, dressed up in bushes. And then again, when they retreat, they come up with a lot of ingenious ways of being able to hide the retreat, including mechanisms like this, where uh, water would drip onto uh, pans from here. When this got too heavy, it would pull the rifle. And then the British, who had left a lot of these, like kind of quote-unquote booby traps and other stuff there, made it seem like they were still there as they pulled out of Gallipoli. And that's where we'll stop for this lecture as we begin to talk about what life is like in the trenches of World War I. Uh, next.